ever pondered over how land revenue settlements were managed during the British rule in India? It's a fascinating part of history that shaped the agricultural landscape of the country. Land revenue settlements, for those who may not be familiar, were systems put in place by the British for the collection of revenue from the land. This revenue was primarily derived from agriculture, which was, and still is, a major source of livelihood for a significant portion of the Indian population. Now, why were these settlements important, you ask? Well, they were vital as they formed the financial backbone of the British administration in India. They also had profound impacts on the socio-economic fabric of the country, influencing everything from the pattern of land ownership to the relationships between landlords and tenants. There were three main types of land revenue settlements introduced by the British in India. The Permanent Settlement, the Ryatwari Settlement and the Mahalwari Settlement. Each of these systems had its own unique characteristics, intricacies and impacts on the people and the economy. The Permanent Settlement, introduced in 1793, was the earliest of the three. This system involved a fixed amount of revenue to be paid by landlords to the British government, regardless of the income generated from the land. Then came the Ryotwari Settlement, implemented primarily in the Madras and Bombay Presidencies. In this system, the British dealt directly with the individual cultivator or riot, bypassing any intermediaries. Lastly, we had the Mahalwari settlement. This was a sort of middle ground between the permanent and Ryotwari systems. It involved revenue collection from a group of villages or Mahals with the responsibility of payment shared among the villagers. Each of these systems had its own set of consequences, shaping the course of agricultural, economic and social developments in different regions of India during the British rule and beyond. Ready to journey back in time to understand these three systems? Buckle up! Imagine you're a landowner in 1793 Bengal. The British introduced the permanent settlement. What does that mean for you? In the last decade of the 18th century, a gentleman by the name of Lord Cornwallis introduced a system of land revenue collection known as the permanent settlement. This system was first implemented in Bengal and later extended to other parts of British India. The crux of this system was the Zamindars or landlords who were now recognized as the owners of the land they controlled. This was a significant shift from the traditional Indian system where the king was the ultimate owner of all lands. Now, the Zamindars were given the right to collect revenues from the peasants who tilled the land. In return, these Zamindars had to pay a fixed amount of revenue to the British. This amount was predetermined and was not subject to change, regardless of the year's harvest. This meant that even if the crops failed due to a drought or flood, the Zamindars were still obligated to pay the same amount to the British. This system did have its advantages. For the British, it provided a steady and predictable income. It also transferred the risk of agricultural uncertainty from the British to the Zamindars. The Zamindars, on the other hand, got the legal recognition as the owners of the land and could pass it on to their heirs. But there were significant downsides too. The fixed revenue demand often led to exploitation of the peasants. In case of a bad harvest, the Zamindars would still need to pay the British, and they often extracted this from the peasants, sometimes through harsh measures. The Zamindars, many of whom were not traditionally farmers, lacked the incentive to invest in the improvement of their lands, leading to a decline in agricultural productivity over time. So, that was the permanent settlement. But the British didn't stop there. They introduced another system in the southern and western parts of India. Enter the Ryotwari settlement, a system that sought to deal directly with the cultivators. How does that change things? Well, let's take a trip back to the year 1820. A man named Thomas Munro introduced a new system known as the Ryotwari settlement. Munro was a British civil servant who had a different vision for the relationship between the government and the cultivators. He believed that the cultivators should be recognized as the rightful owners of their land. So, under the Ryotwari settlement, the cultivators, also known as riots, were given the status of landowners. They were no longer tenants paying rent to a landlord, but owners who paid revenue directly to the government. This was a significant shift from previous systems where the government used intermediaries, such as zamindars or landlords, to collect the land revenue. But what does this mean for the cultivators? Well, on the surface, it may seem like a positive change. 
The cultivators were now considered the owners of the land they toiled on, which could be seen as a step towards empowerment. However, the system was not without its challenges. The revenue demand under the Rayotwari settlement was often high, and failure to pay could result in the loss of land. This put enormous pressure on the cultivators, who were dependent on the unpredictable monsoon rains for a successful harvest. If the rains failed, they could find themselves in a difficult situation, unable to pay their revenue and at risk of losing their land. Moreover, the introduction of the Riotwari settlement also meant a change in the traditional social structure. The cultivators were no longer under the protection of their landlords and they had to deal directly with the government officials, which could be a daunting experience. The Riotwari system certainly had a different impact on the people, but the British had one more trick up their sleeve, the Mahalwari system. Last but not least, let's delve into the world of the Mahalwari system. What was it and how did it affect the people? The Mahalwari system was introduced in the year of 1833 and it was primarily implemented in the northwestern parts of India. This system was an interesting blend, a concoction if you will, of the permanent and Riotwari systems. Here, the revenue was not collected directly from the individual farmer or from the landlord, but rather from a group of cultivators known as a Mahal. This term, Mahal, originally an Arabic word, referred to a place or a house. But in the context of the Mahalwari system, it stood for a village or a group of villages. The Mahal, as a collective, was held responsible for the payment of taxes. The revenue officials would fix the amount of tax for the entire Mahal, and the cultivators were left to decide how they would distribute that tax amongst themselves. Now, you might wonder, did this system improve the lives of the cultivators? Well, the answer is a bit more complicated than a simple yes or no. On one hand, the Mahalwari system did offer some advantages. For instance, it recognized the peasants' hereditary rights to the land and it also allowed them to sell or mortgage their land. This was a significant shift from the Rayotwari system, which had placed numerous restrictions on the peasants. On the other hand, however, the Mahalwari system also had its share of drawbacks. The tax burden was quite heavy and the peasants often found themselves in debt. Furthermore, the collective responsibility for tax payment led to numerous disputes and conflicts among the cultivators. In essence, while the Mahalwari system did make some strides in recognizing the rights of the peasants, it also perpetuated the cycle of debt and poverty that was all too common in agrarian societies of the time. So that's the Mahalwari system for you. But what does all of this mean in the grand scheme of things? We've journeyed through the permanent, Riotwari and Mahalwari systems. But why does any of this matter? Well, these three land revenue settlements introduced during the British rule were not just about tax collection. They were mechanisms that transformed the agricultural landscape of India and significantly influenced the socio-economic conditions of the people. To recap, the permanent settlement implemented in Bengal and Bihar essentially created a class of intermediary landlords known as Zamindars. They collected revenue from the peasants and paid a fixed amount to the British. This system had the impact of creating a new elite class while leaving the actual cultivators at the mercy of these new landlords. Next, we delved into the Riotwari settlement, prevalent in Madras and Bombay presidencies. Here, the British dealt directly with the peasants or riots. Each riot became the owner of his land and was responsible for paying the tax directly to the state. This system aimed at eliminating middlemen, but it also put immense pressure on the peasants, who were often subject to high tax rates. Finally, we discussed the Mahalwari settlement, which was a hybrid of the two previous systems. Implemented in the northwestern provinces, central provinces and parts of Punjab, the responsibility of tax payment was on a group of peasants or a village community known as a Mahal. This system carried elements of both the previous systems and also had its own unique set of challenges and implications. Each of these systems had a profound impact on the agricultural landscape and socio-economic conditions of India during British rule. They influenced land ownership, agrarian relations and peasant life, shaping the trajectory of rural India in significant ways. But it's not just about the past. These systems continue to influence land relations and agricultural practices in India today, making their understanding crucial for anyone interested in India's socio-economic history.
Understanding these systems gives us a glimpse into the past. It reminds us of the struggles, the triumphs, and the resilience of the people who worked the land. Until next time, keep exploring history.